<laughs> Welcome, uh, everybody. Um, I'm glad you're here, so many of you. I brought my uh, Kudi Kudi Rietveld uh, chair. Um, I think this is one of the most iconic Dutch designs. And when we ask our uh, cartoonist of our booklet, you have also seen, I think it was just one slide back. Let me see it. Here it is. How do you stop this? Now, this, is, this, is the, this is a cartoon by Louvain, who's sitting over there. And when we asked him, can you draw a cartoon for a program about Dutch design, he immediately came up with this beautiful chair. So that's, that's, that's very nice. And it will also be in the presentation of uh, Timo de Rijk. You will wait and see. Um, welcome, everybody. Welcome, of course, to our speaker of this evening. I will introduce you in due course. Um, but first, the students. Welcome to all students. Who is going to, the, to Australia, Indonesia on the study tour? Oh, quite a few. Good to see. And the, the study, study tour is called KU Java. What does it mean? Tuan, explain. Um, um, during your study tour, you are going to uh, compare industrial design in uh, Indonesia and Australia to Dutch design. That, that's the basic idea behind the, the study tour. Um, but in order to make this comparison, uh, to make this comparison, I think it's very necessary to understand what Dutch design is. So that's why we invited Timo de Rijk. Timo de Rijk, he is a full professor um, in design history. He has taught at the uh, Technical University in Delft and Leiden University. Um, since 2016, he is the director of the Design Museum in Den Bosch. And he is author of several books. I will only mention a few that you get an idea um, what, what he also wrote. Norm is Forum. Uh, it's about standardiz standardization and design. Um, he wrote a book about Daan Rosengaarde, whom you probably know, Interactive Landscapes. He wrote a book about Art Deco in the Netherlands. And he is uh, co-author of several Dutch design yearbooks. You probably know them. It's, it's, yeah, if, if, if someone has a good idea what Dutch design is, it's Timo de Rijk. Timo, the floor is yours, and my mic starts, is starting to sing around, so I'll shut this off. I want a uh, very big hand for Timo, and I will get your presentation yep. on the screen. Much. Thank you for attending, well, a large crowd. Thank you for the invitation, it's great to be here. I once was here years ago with my professor, Professor Drucker. Some of you might know him. I taught with him, I uh, gave lectures with him in Delft, uh, and I also taught in Amsterdam and in Leiden. But it's, it's, it's fantastic to be here in this great surroundings. I hope to shed some light on the idea of Dutchness and what Dutch design is. And I'm afraid I already have to warn you, especially the students, that this is not a manual to compare uh, with Indonesian or Australian design. This is not a kind of aesthetic, uh, rigid ground for you to take under your, on your arm and go to Australia and compare it and come back. So this is the difference and this is, this is the same more or less. This is, I'm going to give more questions than answers, I'm afraid. So there's once again an academic who spoils our evening. Yes, that's me, I'm sorry. Um, what, you, what is Dutch and what is Dutch identity and what is Dutchness? Uh, we, will, we will swim around in that idea and of course I invite you to think with me and well share the problems and share the questions and, and maybe enjoy what we are. But maybe first a question, who of you is from the Netherlands? Who is not from the Netherlands? They're all in the back, <laughs> that's very <sort of> strange. <laughs> um, who thinks of themselves as I'm typically Dutch. Well, 10, 15. And why? In behavior. In behavior. In comparison with uh, other cultures. In comparison with other cultures. How would you describe yourself in comparison with other cultures? Well, I can be very direct. And, uh, can be very direct and yeah. maybe blunt. Blunt. And compared. The other yeah. <laughs> and that's I important. Yeah, yeah, it's important to express yourself. Yeah, I know. I know. Yeah. And you compare yourself to, for instance, All other people from France. I, I if you go to Indonesia, beware of being too blunt. Yeah? yeah? Well, that's the first lesson already. 
So Dutch being Dutch is being blunt and being direct. That's what you said. I think you're not maybe not you're not blunt, but you're direct. Who thinks of himself as being Dutch more? Who who's that more? I saw a few fingers in the back. Yeah, I do think myself as Dutch. Typically Dutch. And why is typically Dutch? Why is that? How do you describe yourself as typ typical Dutchman? And now maybe one more question: Is there someone here? who thinks that he or she is typically Dutch, aesthetically. Maybe you? Yeah? <laughs> there we, <laughs> we found him, we found him. <laughs> and why? Uh, tall, blonde, blue eyes. Rutger Hauer. <laughs> okay. And the way you dress? Um, and the way you cut your hair, for instance? Weather resistant. <laughs> I think you're right. I think you're right. Okay, so maybe we can find today, we already, you know, uh, have some clues maybe to, uh, to understand what Dutch culture is or what Dutch aesthetic is. I mean, we, I'm talking about design. So design, I think, is both what's inside, what's meant with it, uh, maybe what's the DNA of, it, of, of what, you, what you can't see, but it's meant to be. And the other side is how it shows, purely static. That, that's the most easy part. Well, let's give it a try. Maybe a lot of people think this is typically Dutch, you know? We will tell a little bit more later. Who knows this car? BMW i8, says this young lady. That's true. Where is it made? Probably designed in Germany, and you don't know where it's made. Okay, yeah, it's a German car. Yeah, who who agrees? It's a German car. So do I. <laughs> you you you're starting to get awkward. <laughs> okay, this is a BMW, and no doubt, the manufacturer BMW from Ingolstadt in Germany makes wants to make us believe that it's a German car. It's not a French car. It's not a South American car. It's not a Korean car. No, it's a typically German car. At least I think that's what they try to communicate. Not in this picture, but in you know, shows and brochures, etc. This one. It's a Renault, who has been here a few months ago. <laughs> it's a Renault. Where is the, this car from? It's from France. W would you say that these cars are typically German and, and French? They look Italian. Yes. <laughs> yeah, maybe I agree. Maybe I agree. In the way they are, you know, you know the, the conventional idea of, or the traditional idea of it being Italian. I had the board of BMW, or part of the board of BMW, uh, in my museum a couple of months ago. And I thanked them for this Dutch car. They were annoyed, I can tell you. But they <laughs> this is the flagship of BMW. And, well, anybody of you who dives into the world of cars and Formula One and, you know, all the, like I do, uh, know that this car is designed by a Dutchman. And the right, on the right hand, is also designed by a Dutchman. How is that possible? Of course, that's possible. I mean, if you are a little bit into the car manufacturing, you know, I think 2,000 people are designing cars for BMW. And 600 people are designing cars for Renault. And Laurens van der Acker is traveling the world to make us believe that he draws everything by hand, which is, of course, not true. It's impossible. BMW has 60 different models to sell. Do you really think that Adria van Hooydok designs them themselves? No. Nevertheless, BMW, a German car company, makes us think he designed the car and he travels the world to communicate that. Where are we with that idea that this is a German? Is it possible? Some of you are designers, or go to be designers. Is it possible that you make a German car as a Dutchman or a Dutch girl? Well, you can try to find what a German car aesthetic is and then try to design towards it. But yeah. You're trying, very, very smart, you're trying to design towards it. That sounds like fake. You want to approach, yeah, okay. 
until now you're not hired by BMW, I can tell you, but you have to do a little bit better, even, 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 even a little bit more. There is something like a brand heritage also, you know? I'm sorry. There is also something like a brand heritage, you know? Something that Adrian van Hooydonk has to talk about when he talks about the BMW. But, I mean, you know the problem. The moment you're hired by BMW, they want you as a Dutch girl, I presume, a woman, to, with your compatriots, to de a, Span a Spaniard, a Moroccan, someone from South Korea, to design a German <coughs> car. And we all think that's possible. Yeah, true. And you also understand if I say that's fake. Yeah, that's yeah? so true. Do we like fake in our society? <laughs> no. Nevertheless, BMW is a highly profitable car. Yeah, agree? Yeah. Let's continue. This is still, <laughs> we're only got questions. It's not about, you know, solving problems. This is a few years ago. Um, I was just a director in the museum for one year, and I was approached to cooperate with this very large program of our national government. Mondrian to Dutch design. A very strange program because th the way they told me it's about the art movement, the style that was established in 1917. So they had a jubilee of 100 years. But because the international community has never heard of the style, but all understand Mondrian, they say it is 100 years from Mondrian to Dutch design. Yeah, are you still there? It was hard to believe for me, but okay, that's what they're trying of the Office of Tourism to sell to the world. And it is about the style, okay, only in very small letters. And it's also about, of course, a hundred year innovation. Yeah, that's what, we wa that's what we want to be. We want to be, as Dutch people, innovative people. And this is what innovation looks like, <laughs> apparently. So in that program, they asked me to combine the chair of Peter, the, 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 the Gerrit Rietveld chair, the red and blue chair, designed in 1918, and who, the chair that became red and blue was painted red and blue in 1921. And there's, for, according to this program and our national government, um, a shared quality between th these two pieces of furniture, the left, the De Stijl, the Gerrit Rietveld chair from 1918, and on the right, one of the most famous pieces of furniture of Dutch design from 1991. Can you see the difference? I hope you can. If you can't, you have to leave the room. <laughs> yes? So how can we compare these two pieces of furniture? I mean, I can disagree, but our government apparently believes that this is from the same idea, from the same mentality, from the same DNA, innovation, but apparently they don't look like each other. How is that possible? How is it possible? Is it only a matter of time that we are going to think in a different way about products? Or is there something else going on? That was a very large program. I refused to be in it as a museum, but I didn't succeed. I had to do, I had to get along because our government always says museums and universities are independent, but they aren't. They have to believe in modernity, they have to believe in inclusivity, they have to believe in innovation, of course. The moment I said to someone from the government, I don't believe in innovation, I'm dead. You know, I can resign as a museum director. That was not always the case. That program was very big. Here it starts with our king, together with the director of this, the Gemeente Museum, now called the Kutz Museum, in The Hague. And it was all over the place. This was the famous city hall of Richard Meyer, an American um, decorated. Piet Mondrian maybe would have loved it, but I'm not very sure. Uh, that this is the city hall of Richard Meyer in uh, The Hague. This is, I think, in Apeldoorn. Is someone sure about that? Well, also, the same decoration, the same year, all shouting, this company, this city, this country. 
well, you know, is in one, um, is created in one idea with something that started in 1970, the De Stijl, de Piet, Mondrian movement. It was also in Amersfoort, because Piet Mondrian, I think he bought a pipe there, or he g went to the school for a couple of years, I don't know. And they made, well, a bus station like this. But that wasn't enough. They also wanted to do this. <laughs> It's, it has, it's never established, it's never established. It's also in Amersfoort, um, oh sorry, oh. It's also here, I think it's Winterswijk. Piet Mondrian lived there for a couple of years. It's also here, in Drachten, in Friesland. Piet Mondrian never went there, but you know, a fellow, a fellow a friend of him painted a few houses in this, this, this style colors in 1920. So, did the style, Piet Mondrian, and this kind of aesthetic apparently is very Dutch, and we try to connect with this kind of aesthetics and that kind of culture. And you can easily describe, maybe not from this one or this one or this one, well, let's, let's take this one as an aesthetic that is transparent, an, tr an aesthetic that you would call modern, an aesthetic that you would call crisp and clear an aesthetic that resembles our country, an aesthetic that almost connects to our national flag. Yeah, agree? No? Yes? Yeah, you, you can't deny it, no? Let's see. This is the best connection, of course. Let's try to connect the style, Piet Mondrian, and what's also typically Dutch, flowers. It's hard to find blue flowers, so let's take purple ones, but you know, you got the message. Even in a, what's it called, a blue macorso, uh, a flower parade, you can, well, y let's call it, a, communicate a new idea about nature. You know, it's an innovative kind of nature, being a very Dutch kind of nature, well, connected to something very geometrical and transparent, the style. And this is maybe the final phase. You're all, we're almost dead here, of course. <laughs> this is, I think it's the Floriana. I'm not very sure. Um, I'm not very sure if these were flowers, but I think the people who made it were very, very enthusiastic about creating a Mondrian from natural resources. Yeah? This, is, this must be the pinnacle of Dutchness. Yeah? <laughs> And, of course, there's a strong argument to say, of course, we can smile about it, and it's a little bit of caricature, of course. But, of course, we can easily find the qualities in our Dutch history that did, this has meant to be. Already in the 17th and the 16th century, we can find this kind of aesthetics. You know, the so-called polars made in the 16th and 17th century, you know, the product of, well, our king would say, water management of engineering that created a utilitarian landscape that looks like this. You can easily call this a typically Dutch landscape. So how far are you away from Piet Mondrian? How far are you away from that transparent, democratic idea of the style? Not very far. It's already in our veins. It must be when the Netherlands were formed in the 16th century, it was established in our common culture, yeah? It was apparently also there in our classical architecture. While this is a 17th century house just outside The Hague, you can go there, Hofwijk. My wife and I, are, I want to go there for, for years and some, somehow we go to The Hague and then, you know, on the highway, you see it on your left and you go to the city center and then you go back home, so, so you can easily forget it. But it's just, it just outside the Hague and it's a typically Dutch Baroque classical kind of architecture. If you say in Italy in the 17th century or France in the 17th century, this is the house of a nobleman, they would smile at you because a house so simple, so geometrical can't be made for a nobleman. It has to be much to be much more elaborate, much more voluptuous, much more decorative. 
Nevertheless, this is typically Dutch. So there is a strong connection between landscape, architecture, culture, already in the 17th century, with a strong line to the 20th century. To this one, of course. This is maybe the masterpiece of Dutch design. The house Gerrit Rietveld made together with Mrs. Schroeder and now called the Rietveld Schroeder House um, in Utrecht, made in 1924. It is modern inside and out. It is Dutch inside and out. It's almost a 3D composition, modern composition, progressive composition of our, well, very crisp and clear Dutch flag. And now a question. We go almost 100 years back. And you're, well, as you are, a very well educated crowd. You, look, you walk on the street, and a guy like me in another kind of suit in 1930, almost 100 years out, what do you think is typically Dutch and typically modern? What do you expect people like you, maybe a little older, reading newspapers? There was no television, maybe, or listening to the radio, but reading good magazines, art magazines. What would they say? What is typically Dutch and also typically modern and contemporary? Do you think they would have said this one? I'll tell you, out of 100 people, no one would have chosen this one because no one knew it. Yeah, maybe as a strange kind of folly. Have you heard what they built in Utrecht? They're, com they're gone completely crazy. I'll tell you, I'll show you what's considered in 1930 typically Dutch, modern and contemporary. That's this. It's the opposite. In the 20s and 30s, people in the Netherlands didn't think of Mondrian in the style of Gerrit Rietveld. They thought transparent, geometrical, crisp and clear, you know, primary colors. No, they thought the opposite was modern and typically Dutch. Hä? Huh? How is that possible? They thought this was a folly. They thought this was very strange, done by one strange man. And make a map of the Netherlands. How many of this, this style buildings were built? A handful, and not even in this quality. A little bit of paint, you know, red, blue, and white. A few in Rotterdam, who were immediately painted in another color after a few years. One torn down, one only temporarily, one in Utrecht. I don't think there was any uh, one in uh, Amsterdam. There is no one in Hengelo, no one in Enschede, no one in Groningen. Which one? There is a house in this style and made in the 20s. We'll talk about that later, but that's one. Yeah? Okay, I'll give that to you. I mean, I didn't know that. I was looking for it when I was home. No, well, say five, no more than 10. They're extremely rare. This, well, this now world famous, typically Dutch design. Chair. You need to know how many of this chair were sold by Gerrit Rietveld before 1940 in this color? Less than 10. Gerrit Rietveld was very poor. <laughs> he, he, sold, he sold a white one. He sold a pink one. And less than 10. How many people have seen before 1940 a chair like this or sit in one? Less than you together in the Netherlands. How is it possible that typically Dutch design, you know, that's coming from who we are, our DNA, deep down inside from the 17th century, is completely not connected to that kind of aesthetics. It's the opposite. And that opposite looks like this. Oh, oh. It's what we call expressionist architecture. It's what we call Amsterdam school architecture. It's not, you know, the best pieces are probably in Amsterdam, but, um, uh, and that's, that's why we call it Amsterdam school, but there are magnificent pieces in other, in, in other places, almost all around the Netherlands. This one, for instance, this is in Paris. When 
1924, there was a commission who was able to choose what's modern and contemporary in the Netherlands. Theo van Doesburg from the De Stijl movement. He was a friend of no one and everyone. He was a very difficult person. He was called an esprit de Salpetre. He was making a fight with everyone, but very famous afterwards and had connections all over Europe. And he thought, well, and he was the front man of the digital movement. And he thought, this is my time. I'm going, he already had an ex ex exhibition in Paris, a small one. He thought, I'm going to resent, represent as being a very modern man with my very modern digital movement in Paris. And he was denied. And he was mad as hell. Because what did the commission choose? This building. This building was presented as being modern and typically Dutch. And why? Someone a little bit educated, educated like you, in 1925, easily could have told us why this is typically Dutch. And you also can make a guess. A windmill. Where? <laughs> the shape. I've never seen it compared with a windmill, but pro you're probably right. <laughs> That's not what I meant. Why is it this, this considered being typically Dutch? The bricks. The, bricks. the waves, the bricks. It's the bricks. The bricks are considered typically Dutch, already uh, applied in the 17th century, in the 18th century, all around. Whether it was true or not, we can, we can fight about that. But in the Netherlands, this kind of architecture, with the use of bricks, with the use of wrought iron, of course, that's, all over, that's, that's, I think, 5,000 years, you know, wrought iron. But in the Netherlands, they thought this is connected to the 17th century. And that was very important in the Netherlands because our golden age, until today, I can give, give you an, an ex example of that later on. The 17th century, contrary to other countries in Northern Europe, is the source in the Netherlands. That's where Dutchness began, but not with the Polders but with the bricks and with craft and not with the idea of the machine age or the modern age, like the De Stijl movement tried to say. Do you think Theo van Doesburg was mad as hell? Yes, of course. When he went to Paris, he saw this. A De Stijl, Piet Mondrian-like environment in the pavilion of Austria by the brilliant architecture, uh, architect Friedrich Kiesler. There you are with your Dutch Dutchness. It's a typical piece of Dutch design, not to be found in the Dutch pavilion, but in the Austrian pavilion. Back to the Amsterdam School. The Amsterdam School was everywhere at a certain point. You know, you could say the source is Amsterdam, the largest and most, well, prolific building maybe in that style is, for instance, in The Hague, the department store, the Bijenkorf, the Beehive, in 1930. Look at the scale, in the center of town. This is quite close to my museum, in the provincial town, Den Bosch. Also, not a single trace of the style, but traces of Amsterdam School and expressionist modernism all around. In Hengelo, I couldn't find one in Enschede. <laughs> Maybe I didn't look close enough, but th this is a very good example of Hengelo. There are all kinds of traces, you know, some weak, some powerful, that with this kind of organic expressionist architecture, co executed in brick, typically brick, is be seen, to be seen in the 20s and 30s all over the Netherlands, in every town. This is what, what was considered um, typically Dutch. But of course, within 10 years, when there was concrete and the style became a little bit more well-known, brick became something that remained typically Dutch, but became, even in that Amsterdam school aesthetics, from modern to traditional. And a very good example of that idea is this exhibition, the Netherlands built in brick, was done in 1942, in the midst of the war, in Boymans van Berning. A museum, a very new museum, 
be considered the most modern museum in Western Europe when it was built. And it looks like this. Built in, in the midst of the crisis, and this was considered a modern building by many people. Does it resemble another building? You might know from a little bit closer here. Built by, this is Ad van der Steer, but by a friend and a classmate of Ad van der Steer. With the same source. This is Friedhof, the city hall in Enschede. Also built in brick. And maybe, you know, in, from our perspective right now, a traditional building, but in the 30s this was a moderate kind of modernism, useful and built in brick, so typically Dutch. Do you think it is typically Dutch? Is it referring to our 17th century one way or the other? Who, who, yeah, maybe, maybe it could be. It was considered like that, but they're making, they're playing a fool with you, those architects because they didn't dive into the 17th century. Those two friends, Ad van der Steur and Geert Friedhof, went to <laughs> this city hall <laughs> in Stockholm. Ragnar Östberg, I think. Is someone from Sweden or Norway or Scandinavia? But then, I, then I can say, tell you that you have to pronounce it Ragnar Östberg. <laughs> in the city hall in Stockholm, a very famous building a new kind of tradition, but at the same, same time considered a very contemporary, not so much modern, but contemporary building. And the guys, in, well, mainly guys, who built these kind of public buildings, went for those kind of buildings, for instance, in Scandinavia, also, and this is slippery what I, what I say right now, because there was felt a common ground on the northern kind of culture, the Nordic cultures. Of course, there, was all, there were already architects who were looking at the south of Europe. These architects were looking at the, at the north of Europe. The 17th century is still, I just told you, powerful as a source, or as a, at least as an idea, that our source of modernity is the 17th century. That's when our innovative, freedom-loving kind of spirit was born. That's the idea. And when already Premier Rutte invited the American uh, President Obama, he took him to the Rijksmuseum, also because he wanted to see him himself. The Night Watch, you know, not so much in style, a typically Dutch painting maybe, or co or of course it is typically 17th century, but the iconography, you know, the, uh, the image itself, was considered a freedom-loving idea of the Netherlands. But one year later, we corrected that image, of course, and we took Obama over to the style. I mean, you don't have to stick too long to the 17th century because that looks too old-fashioned for many people. Why? I already gave it away. What happened that, make, that made that big difference between that before 1940, almost no one knew for, of the style, and no one would mention it if, if, it was, uh, if you were asked what is clearly a contemporary modern style of the Netherlands compared to all of you. If, if Peter shows you this chair, he, didn't, he almost doesn't have to explain what kind of chair it is and who made it, and when, when was it made. This chair has become very famous. This chair has become very famous and that kind of idea that this is Dutchness wasn't there in the 20s and 30s when it was made. It, was, it became famous and important after 1945. And of course because of this. The Second World War, National Socialism and the connection to an other kind of aesthetics, traditional, classical, monumental, megalomaniac, if you want, was very important to change our ideas about what is modern and what belongs to our nation. And for that, they didn't dive into who we are. They simply invented the idea 
that Dutchness was born maybe in the 17th century, but especially when the modern movement was born with the style and the socialist architects. This idea, or this, well, what happened between 1933 and 1945, the, build, the larger buildings of Albert Speer, the ideas of uh, Adolf Hitler was very prominent in formulating what he liked, you know, as, that, uh, as what ha would have been Nazi national socialist culture, because what, what happened in 1945 is a cultural revolution. Of course, many things happened, but the idea of Hitler was to change the culture of his country and become a true German culture. And if that's what you communicate with that evil kind of idea, then it's, well, you can expect what, what happened after 45. You're trying to find the opposite. This is what's not allowed to be built anymore. This kind of architecture is considered evil architecture. But that's strange. Suppose you, we go to Italy and we ask that once again. What do you think? Th are there any people from Italy over there? No. If you ask an Italian, of course, you know, in the, uh, in the company of, of, of these men, Hitler, Bormann, uh, uh, Spears over here, of course you will easily uh, deny this kind of architecture and be very negative about it. But if you only specifically ask this kind of architecture to an Italian, what would he say? It's been, it's been here for 2,000 years. You can look at the Colosseum and you can go everywhere. The classical tradition is everywhere. So the Nazis tried to take it away from us, to take it away from us. But it's still ours. But what, co what, what could we say in the Netherlands? Do you think the Netherlands after 45 was still very fond of classical architecture? Of course not. It was made an evil kind of architecture in a moral sense. So that could not be applied after 45 in the Netherlands and Dutch architects, designers and critics were looking for the opposite. And there they found that strange the style movement again <coughs> that was so very rarely known and suddenly that became the source of what we wanted to be. Modern, transparent, innovative. The, the, govern you know, the government that told me in 2017 that's what you have to be. This kind of <coughs> presentations. This is a presentation in Italy in the late 1970s. Well, if you're very if you dive deep into design history and know a few uh, Dutch designers, well, even there at the later age, of course, you can find Charles Bergmans, who was uh, the inventor of the modern wooden shoe. This is Bruno Nienhaber van Eyve. Of course, in his, well, almost 20s, I think, who designed Dutch money. People from the embassy, very important lady who, now the, who promoted all that stuff. Gijs Bakker, now, well, tomorrow he becomes 82, and we just received his whole archive <coughs> in the museum. And Tom Haas, a famous designer from the 1980s. Well, if you want to meet him, you have to go to Cuba, because he's very fond of uh, black ladies. Well, okay, that, that's true. I mean, sorry. <laughs> what's, what's happening here? What are these guys doing in their 20s and 30s? What are they doing here? Telling to the Italian, ambassador. Are they promoting their own stuff? No doubt that will be, in, uh, uh, no doubt in the show afterwards. No, they're trying to say this chair, the Gerrit Rietveld chair, may be completely unknown until the 1960s. This is the source of everything. Everything. This is, this is where it all started for us. And look how they created their environment. Look how they promoted Dutch design in the 1970s. You're almost ashamed, I have to say, but okay, let's have a good look at it. This is a typically Italian building, classical building. And they put all that beautiful historical material away with abstract kind of, well, paneling to promote that abstract kind of 
Dutch design. You know, Dutch design in the 1970s, fully referring to the source they believe they, they come from, and that's Gerrit Rietveld and the stand. When Gerrit Rietveld built some buildings in the 20s and 30s, he was an unknown man. He was avant-garde. His buildings were considered follies. It was rare to find one. In the 50s, 60s, and 70s, these, this is a, re a late Rietveld, his, his last building, just, just before he died. Um, a very beautiful, large building in Laren. Um, but you can find those kind of bungalows, villas, all over the Netherlands. In every town, you can find these kind of, well, not so beautiful, but modern buildings. Modernity in the 20s and 30s, avant-garde and very rare, suddenly was very common. After 45, everybody, not everybody, but people wanted to be modern. That's a very strange thing to say. If you call people in the 20s, you're a modern person, you had a chance, you, you, they, they felt insulted. People didn't want to be modern. If I tell you right now, well, I don't think you're a very modern girl. You say, well, you're not going to like it. I don't think you are, but... <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're a relief. You show relief, of course. Modern is something good, and it wasn't especially something good in the 20s and 30s. Um, and, well, this is the way... Even the Dutch government thought modernity, that avant-garde, that strange kind of the style design of the 20s, became the source for who we really are, became an example, became a symbol of this is how we want to be. In the same way, the government asked me to, do, to make an exhibition on 100 years the style. They're, they're promoting already for 30 or 40 years the source of modernity and transparency. They do that in stamps like this. They do that in trains. You can find pseudo Mondrians in trains, inside and outside. There's a, a Piet Mondrian train traveling each day from Amsterdam to Düsseldorf and back. It's called Piet Mondrian. Can you believe it? What I'm trying to tell you are these two very important ideas. It's called essentialism and constructionism. I'm sorry. Um, well, I once was a professor, and this is part that I can call a lecture, of course, because you have to learn something. Essentialism. I can tell you easily what it is. How, a question, how do you recognize an older couple in their 60s? I'm not going to ask you, sir. No. <laughs> how are you going to recognize an older couple in their 60s in Paris, as being Dutch. Not by, uh, not by talking, but only by seeing. <coughs> You're in the taxi and suddenly, oh yeah, that must be a Dutch couple. How does it look like? Wild guess. Is it possible? Could it be possible? Who? Who do you? Huh? They're walking. They're walking, yeah, of course. How do, you, how do they look like? Not the, <laughs> the same raincoat. And the Bay style, yeah, a so called A, -A, -A and W B couple. <laughs> it looks like this. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you recognize them? They just buy a raincoat and it's good and they buy a second one. Why do you think this is typically Dutch? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, that's also it's practical, not fashionable. And they are not ashamed of walking around like this in Paris, you know, that elegant city, and you walk around like this. Although this is, of course, not in Paris, and no doubt this is a very sweet couple. Why do you recognize them? I tell you, because you don't recognize all the other couples who look differently. So in your mind, this is going to be, as you say, this is a typical Dutch couple. In your mind establishes the idea, it looks like this, and over and over again, you see them walking around, and then you say to your friend or your partner, well, there they are. And all the other ones are not typically Dutch, but they are Dutch. If you compare it to this, this man can never be a Dutchman. 
although he drives on a bike in the canals of Rotterdam. Because in your mind, this is not a Dutchman. You're completely right, you know, that I, the Bay idea is, of course, <laughs> hilarious. But at the same time, it's a difficult idea, you know, to establish that cliche over and over again. And don't go with that couple of cliches under your arm to Indonesia because you're comparing something that couldn't be compared or is difficult to compare. Yeah? I point my finger because I know, I know it's difficult. Constructionism is the opposite. It's, you could say it's completely fluid. And I can prove that by Dutch design itself. Until the 1990s, Dutch design, the word didn't exist. It was used in the 70s, okay. But now we use Dutch design for everything that has to be sold, everything that's maybe typically Dutch, like that chair. In the 1990s, a new movement of design developed that was going to call itself Dutch design because they thought what we do, what we make, what we organize is typically Dutch. That is this movement. It's called droog design. Well, you can easily see the, f the, you know, the funny paradox of calling something drug design on a very wet photograph. Of course, that's kind of funny. And, well, I know both people quite well, Renny Ramakers and Gijs Bakker, the designer you just saw, you know, in that image, who was then in his 30s, I think, and now he's 82, defined a new, an idea of what Dutchness was in the 1990s. I think I, I tried to characterize maybe 20 times what typically Dutch was, transparent, geometrical, crispy, uh, uh, um, uh, democratic, you know, all of the style characteristics. And Gijs and Rennie said, typically Dutch is ir irony, it's ironic, it's funny, it's playful. Huh? Did I show you something playful until now? Did I show you something ironic until now? No. They invented a new kind of Dutchness. They made it up. It's in suddenly in the 90s, of course, there was something going on amongst young students, amongst young designers, especially Renny was very much aware of what was around her and that certain art academy, the same kind of collage kind of way of making things was around. She tried to define it and she called it Dutch design. Or people around her called it Dutch design. But it had nothing to do with the style. Not in aesthetics, not in mentality. Or was it? Or was it both innovative? And is that sp specifically a characteristic of the Dutch? Well, you are going to tell the French and the, and the, der the, the German and the Americans that the typical characteristic is of being Dutch is being innovative. You know, we are much more innovative than all the other ones. I'm not going to tell them, because I doubt it. How is it possible that suddenly in the 90s everyone agreed, yeah, this is typically, Dutch. this is typically what, what we are. It's what we call invention of tradition. All kind of traditions, not Santa Claus, that's an exception, but there are, there are many traditions our traditions are invented. They don't exist, they don't sometimes develop, but they are invented for a specific reason. And this is a new tradition of Dutch design. It looks different, it feels different, it has a different idea. It's completely made up, you could say, but the style was also completely made up. This is called what we constructionism. It's not from who we are, you can make it up. It's a concept. And that can easily be changed. It's much more open. It's a little more, more aggressive. But it's also slippery. So everything can be Dutch. Do we believe that? That, sir, that, that gentleman over there don't think, doesn't think that. so. You think being direct and blunt, that's typically Dutch. And I agree with him. So it must be something in the middle. But where in the middle? I'll show you a few pieces. This is typically Dutch design from the 1990s. And of course I agree, you know, a table or a chair or, you know, almost childlike 
furniture pieces like this, yeah, you can consider them typically Dutch because they're maybe they're blunt <laughs> and direct and easy to draw and simple. And they connect to something like, you know, a sausage of the Hema, like that. And the Hema, who explicitly, not now anymore, but for a long time, tried to be a very Dutch uh, company in coloring, in boldness, in clearness, in crispiness. But we just learned that's an invention. This is typically Dutch. Something that, has, that can be found on the table, you turn it upside down. And you know, everybody knows that if you, uh, if you give a toast to each other, a good glass has a good sound, so you can use it for something else. Is that typically Dutch? Maybe it is. And this was typically Dutch suddenly in the 1990s and early 2000s. Does it, can it be compared in what, in what way or the other to the De Stijl movement, to the idea of De Stijl? Not at all. Nevertheless, everyone around 2000 agreed, yeah, this is typically Dutch, it's ironic, it's playful, it's found on the street, it's close to you, it can be made with your bare hands. Well, not so much the couch, but these kind of things. So the saying by Queen Maxima, the Dutch identity does not exist. I'm sorry about this picture. <laughs> I know those two ladies, they were so very proud that Maxima opened their store. Um, and there was a room full of, well, Dutch design, you know, some five, six years, years ago. And it was the same, well, she was, she was still a princess, it was a few years before, that Queen, Princess Maxima said, the, the Dutch identity doesn't exist, at least I couldn't find it. And she was wooed away, many people thought, you, from Argentina, are not going to tell us what Dutch identity is, and you have to look better, because there is something inside us that really, that, that connects us. And maybe you don't belong to it, very conservative idea. But Maxima, of course, tried to say, no, the idea of being Dutch is not a specific set of ideas, that is Dutchness. It's much wider. Many people belong to it, or could belong to it. It's a very human humanistic kind of approach to what that Dutchness could be. Um, so that we have two very different positions. The one is, you know, very internal. That Dutchness comes from within. It's in your DNA. It's established in the 16th century. It developed. And once you were born in the clay of the Netherlands, you're a Dutchman or a Dutch girl. You're typically Dutch. Bold, blunt, etc. Yeah? with an A-N-W-B raincoat. Yeah? And on the other side, almost everyone can belong to, to it. Queen Maxima from Argentina can be Dutch. The black man, the colored man on the bike can be very Dutch. Isn't there something in between that makes uh, us or the people who belong to that idea, that imagined community, as Benedict Anderson said, that makes us maybe typically Dutch? I have one suggestion. And maybe that's, well, a proposition to compare to Indonesia and Australia, but especially Indonesia. And I gave you the, the last example. It's also a question. The question I ask to my students, well, previous students, suppose you find this image in an archive. You will become design historian like me. And you find this photograph in an old box in the box, in an archive of a designer, I'll tell you, of the 19... Uh, five images? Okay. Um, oh, designer of the 1950s. I'll help you a little bit. What do we see? What do you do? You find a photograph. What do you do? Turn around. Someone said... Uh, huh? Laughing. Why laughing? You recognize in what way? F for you, this is a nostalgic room. <coughs> yeah. It's from s something like f 1953. Y you must be younger. A little, yeah? <laughs> you were very young in those days. Um, yes, it can be very nostalgic um, for people who, who experience this, kind, this period. But, well, suppose you're a young design historian. 
Well, of course, you turn the photograph upside down because you want to read on the back what's there. That's, but that's not what I mean. Have a close look. What kind of room is this? A living room. What kind of living room? What kind of living room? It's also a kitchen, maybe for one person. Yeah, studio, yeah. Very functional. It's from Goed Wonen, yeah, yeah, that, uh, probably you're right. And how can you see, Goed, you have to explain later on. People can go there and can see, learn how to make their own room. And how can you see that in such room? Have a good look, every one of you can see it. It has a rope, it has two ropes in front. What kind of room is it? It's a model room, it's an instruction room. It says, this is the way to do it. And how do we learn this is the way to do it? Because the next room, of course you can't see that on this picture, the next room in the same museum looks like this. <laughs> in 1953, the people from Goed Woden, Good Living, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't mentioned a beautiful living or comfortable living, no, Good Living. <laughs> uh, remind that are comparing this room, and no doubt it has a text panel on it. This is the way we, you have to do it. Otherwise, you're a bad person. You're old fashioned. You're not modern. You belong, you're almost a fascist. I, I, I found those texts that people who live in a place like this are mentally weak. It's not, it's not my idea, it's Goed Wonen from the 1950s. And uh, maybe deep down inside, I think and that's the proposition I give you, if you go to Indonesia, what shares a lot of ideas in the Netherlands, who, and, and in the field of design, who don't look at it, well, it, who don't look very similar, but deep down inside we share one idea. And I think we're morally inspired. These, many of these interiors and designs are ethically driven. They have an idea to make a better world. Who of you is a student at, industrial at the school here for design, architecture, industrial design? Many of you. you no doubt you have connections to students in Eindhoven or Delft or, I don't know, or, or at least heard of it. Who of those of that schools, who of those students is interested in purely commercial design? Simply to make a, simply to make a lot of money. Are there tutors, maybe not here, or professors teaching you the only purpose of, of, of your design life is to make as much money as you can? I have never heard it in the Netherlands. It's always we are going to make a better world, or we are going to make a better situation, or we're going to make a better product for your for your grandparents. It's motivated by an ethical connotation. And I think if there's one thing in the Netherlands that is a quality that you can find almost everywhere, of course not everywhere, almost everywhere, then it's a kind of morally inspired idea that the designer is going to create a better world. And I hope you can compare that to people and their products in Indonesia. For instance, this one, Marielle van Aubel, I promised you I'd <laughs> I, I, I bring it along. If you look to a product or a design she made, in my opinion, this can be made everywhere. This is a kind of beautiful international aesthetics. Nevertheless, for me, it's Dutch because it tries to solve a problem. Don't people in Germany or America solve problems? Of course they do. But I think the ethical drive is the main point in Dutch design. Thank you very much. Thank you, Timo. Can I have my mic uh, switched on? Thank you very much. Do we still have some time? No. Yes, of course. Yeah, I, I think that we, we. No, no, you didn't talk too much. I think we have uh, 25 minutes left for questions, so I'll get the mic. Thank you so much for your inspiring lecture, which gave a lot of food for thought. Um, and I, I thought the students were confused, in, and perhaps you were during the talk, but in the end it ended up clear with your proposition. I think students always have to be confused. Yes. That's being a student, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Uh, and uh, what I want to summarize, perhaps, um, two very interesting things you, you mentioned is that Dutchness and modernity are inventions. <coughs> they are invented by people for... M well, modernity is not an invention as such, of course. I mean, I think that's, that's, that's a large process, well, many processes of things. Mm -hmm. But I think Dutchness is, well, no doubt an invention. And mm -hmm. sometimes it's even an invention by our government. Mm -hmm. who, who, you know, uh, manage, manages by example or by regulation mm -hmm. and tells me as a museum director or tells you as a student in industrial design, be innovative, be progressive, be pointed at the future, be inclusive, which are all good things. I mean, mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not criticizing that. But, I mean, they were diving in, the, in, in history to make us believe that our culture, our Dutch culture, mm -hmm. th the main character is being innovative. And I think that's complete nonsense. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, but the idea of modernism, you, that's... That's a very difficult idea. Yeah, <laughs> but, yeah but, but I understood from your talk that it's also created somehow, because in the 1930s it was modern to love the old stuff, the, the bricks, and then after the war, yeah. Yeah. the whole style movement yeah. got, got modern. Yeah. So. For, for me, it's not so much that modernity or modernism itself is invented, mm -hmm. but um, the idea or, or the way it's communicated or the aesthetics of modernity mm -hmm. are invented. Okay. And the connotations or, well, the, the connotations of all kinds of different um, uh, visualizations and designs mm -hmm. uh, change, change over time. I mean... Um, if you bought a Rietveld chair in 1925 mm -hmm. and you were able to like it and to live with it and to communicate to other people, this is, well, this is the new man and his new environment. Mm -hmm. For me, you're a true modern. If you buy the same chair right now mm -hmm. in a kind of furniture store and, you know, make yourself comfortable on your couch and look at your Rietveld chair, mm -hmm. well, you're not the same person as in 1925, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, you can be uh, a very good person, no doubt about it, but that's a different kind of modernity. It's still the same, cha the same chair. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And our, go well, our government, but we also, I mean, no doubt your, 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 your teachers who, 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 who teach you to, to design also give, gives that kind of examples. They will not give you bad examples, or at least I don't. I hope so. They, I mean, you are here for the good. You are here for to make you know something good, not something bad. <laughs> if so, tell me who that teaches you, and I'll call him or her and say that that's something wrong. But there's always an image of the good thing and the modern thing and the progressive thing, mm -hmm. and that's not the same thing as being modern and being progressive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For me, it's referring to the style in 2017. For me, that doesn't. That for me, that's not an example of modernity or mm -hmm. an example of being progressive or being an example of being innovative. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's you know, it's cosmetics. Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, we go for question, but I had one question about the chair, which which um, was in your presentation. Um, could you perhaps explain um, what's morally inspired? What what did what's the moral inspiration yeah. by Rietveld? Because maybe you can. I, I, I yeah. think I think well there are of course many members of the style movement. Theo van Doesburg was an important one. I think mm -hmm. the most the most intriguing one. Mm -hmm. Gerrit Rietveld uh, and Mondrian. But but let's stick to Gerrit Rietveld. Gerrit Rietveld maybe he wasn't a, a utopian, but he had clearly in mind that we, um, well in a very humanistic way, we need to be to become new, new kind of people with a new kind of aesthetics and mm -hmm. don't long for yesterday, but you know, are reaching for tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And for me, there's a morality in it. That's, well, it's telling you, this is the way you have to live. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Rietveld wasn't very rigid uh, in these kind of ideas. Mm -hmm. He was very kind of, kind of loose in a way. Mm -hmm. But many architects alongside him had that moral uh, inspiration, or at least that that moral example to people, this is the way you should, li you should live and you become a better person. Be yes, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. I think Rietveld would have never said such a thing. 
uh, but many Dutch designers did. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Rietveld himself was pretty down to earth. He was just uh, making it. Rietveld was a very humanistic man. Yeah, okay. I, uh -huh. I know of people of the 1950s, as well, years ago I spoke to them, Dutch designers who went to Italy. And in Italy, Italian designers, you know, completely different kind of design culture in Italy, especially in the 60s, of mm -hmm. course, were very interested in, in, well, Dutch design, but design in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. And they asked their uh, Dutch guests, young designers who went to Italy to work because there, there wasn't much work in the Netherlands. And they said, can you make a trip to the Netherlands so we can study modern design from the 20s and 30s? We were interested in that. Mm -hmm. And the only thing they were interested in was Gerrit Rietveld and the Amsterdam School. While the Dutch guys thought, they were all guys, they were interested in modernism, they were interested in the vanilla factory, they were interested in Duiker. Mm -hmm. And the Italians, the Italians said, we're not going to look at it because that kind of architecture is Auschwitz to us. Really? Okay. That's strong, that's strong, yeah. Incredible. Yeah. Okay. That doesn't, that's not very, very, very good example, mm. of course, to, 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 uh, to explain why it's a moral uh, kind of design, but nevertheless, it's a very rigid kind of design, in the very, mm -hmm. in the eyes of Italians, very unhuman. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, interesting. We go for questions. There you are. Thank you. Is there a need for public, and what kind of public, for Dutch design? Is there a need for public, for an no. audience? Yeah. It's a very good question. Uh, well, I think um, every designer, and that's why designing is magic, and I think that's the reason why there are so many people here right now. Designers think about the future, they think about tomorrow, and there's always a kind of magic around people who creating something new that's, that's not there. So I hope uh, there is an audience, well, they communicate with an audience and try to make, well, the world a, a, a better place. But if your question is, is there an audience for the things you just saw, these are, of course, well, many of them are statements and are not sold in large quantities. And there's not a buying audience for them. I mean, <laughs> Uh, that's the, uh, for me, that's the negative side of, of Dutch design, and I can easily say it at the technical university, I think, but many of those author designs, I mean, these are designers who, well, compare themselves to artists, um, they don't think of an audience. They think of a gallery who buys their pieces from the gallery, or they think of a museum who buys their pieces to put in uh, a museum <laughs> show. Of course, that's also an audience, but that's very small. <laughs> Is that an answer to your question? Okay. Yeah. okay. I saw a question up there. I'm going upstairs. And while I'm going <laughs> upstairs, uh, Timo, I want to ask what, what do you think Mondrian would have thought about all his uh, paintings be, uh, being used in a very decorative way on a sailing boat, on the, the Hague I think town hall? Uh, I, th I think he would not have liked it. No, uh, wh no. why not? What because it. Uh, uh, it makes his paintings or his ideas decoration. Yes. And, yeah. uh, well, almost like Kandinsky, Mondrian was, was, he was more a 19th century painter than we like to accept. He was a geistly kunstler. He was thinking of, well, the spirit of people. Mm -hmm. And there is not much spirit in a decoration of a hair gel or a shampoo, I think. No. I mean, it can be very or beautiful, but train toilet, that's, that's yeah. definitely not what Mondrian meant. Uh -huh. he, also, he also prescribed to museums, for instance, to the Kunstmuseum, Gemeente Museum. Uh, he, 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 it was built in 1933 or 34. Um, and one of the first shows showed a, a, an early Mondrian who was given to artists to the new Gemeente Museum. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mondrian was in Paris and he wrote to Theo van Doesburg who went to the opening, who was very negative about the building by the way, and he asked van Doesburg, did they hang my painting along other ones? Because I don't want that. I want my paintings, uh, my painting to be hung alone in the hallway as high as possible. Mm -hmm. Have you ever seen a Mondrian painting alone in a museum as high as possible? I didn't. Mm -hmm. 
I, and I haven't, let alone that it's used for, well, mm -hmm. hair gels and shampoos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. That's clear. Go ahead. Thank you, and thank you for your interesting talk. Um, with the increasing popularity of the Dutch design brand, do you think that designers might be too quick to call themselves Dutch design because they know it, it will sell? I.e., is there a point where Dutch design and as a label goes too far? Yeah, and that point was there, all, I think, something like 15 years ago. <laughs> For me, Dutch, that any, anyone who tries to sell his or her products with the quality of being Dutch design uh, well, at, le at least doesn't attract, at, uh, 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 attract me. I mean, it, it doesn't say anything anymore. It's only a very superficial uh, way of branding your product. Um, so it's, 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 it's become obsolete, I think, 10 or 15 years ago. So don't use the, the Dutch design brand, ladies and gentlemen. I, I would not recommend it to you. So just being a Dutch design... So just being a Dutch designer doesn't make it Dutch design, is what you're saying? Um, well, to, to start with, <laughs> but um, well, as I, my, I already tried to explain, Dutch design is not a series of aesthetics, but is a kind of, well, as they say themselves, a mentality. So what did, for instance, uh, well, the art school in Arnhem or also the design academy in Eindhoven <laughs> trying to do? Well, it's not about aesthetics, like, for, in, for instance, Scandinavian design or Danish design. Danish design is typically about aesthetic. You can easily recognize a piece of Danish design made in the 50s or 60s and 70s. A piece of Dutch design, I'll try to, well, I can show you more pieces as well. After a while, there is no common ground anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so there is not a shared kind of aesthetic. So what the Design Academy in Eindhoven says, well, it's not about aesthetics, it's about mentality. So everybody who goes to school in our place, from Italy or whatever, you know, you, you now have two famous Italian designers, Forma Fantasma, really beautiful, you know, aesthetic pieces, typically Italian design according to me, but they're branded by Eindhoven as typically Dutch design. Are you still there? <laughs> Can you use that kind of, it's not branding, it's, you know, of course it's branding, but it doesn't say anything about your product, I think. Thank you. Okay, yeah. thanks. Go ahead. Uh, you were talking about the German cars, and I think one of the students said that if they were requested to make a German car, they would kind of research what it means to make German cars. And you yeah. said that it was kind of a fake way of doing it, no yeah. true yeah. German way of doing it. But yeah. how would a German go about designing a German car? Would that not be kind of the same process? Or to I put the <laughs> question in a slightly different o way? Of course, I try to suggest that it's fake. I don't. Re I mean, I try to... Uh, to, to, to suggest there, there's, there's authenticity and fake at stake. I mean, the moment you consider yourself a truly Dutch designer, because, I mean, your great-grandparents were born in the 17th century in the same place like you, and you know everything about the language and the country, etc. That's why you're, that's the only way you can make Dutch design. Yeah, the moment a, a German guy tries to do, or girl tries to do the same, then it becomes fake. But I also, I also question, is that really true? I mean, is it really true that, um, that Adria van Hooydonk can't design a typically German car? And I, of course, I tried to tease mm. this lady a little bit whether it's fake or not. I don't think the mic is working. I had a related question, yeah, yeah. but kind of differently. All right. Um, is there a way to really define what Dutch design or German design is? while you're still in the act of doing it? Or is that something that can only be determined a hundred years later after we've determined that apparently Mondrian is the, the standard of the Dutch design? Yeah, I, I, I think I would, I, 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 w I would not try it. I mean, I think it's not, in the end, it's not a very interesting uh, quality to describe for me. I mean, of course, in the 1990s, spirit of the 90s, and that was called droog design, dry design, and well, a museum called it, this is, this is Dutch design, you know, this, this, this comes from Arnhem and Eindhoven and uh, Utrecht. And so it functioned for a couple of years. But, well, our government went back to the 1920s and also called that Dutch design. They call what's being produced right now Dutch design. Um, I'm invited many times over the last couple, couple of years by embassies uh, abroad. 
embassies are embassies are and, 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 and diplomats are extremely fond of the idea of Dutch design because they think it's easy uh, to explain, it's easy to take with you, uh, it's not art but it looks like art, and you can you know you, you, you can talk about problems and solutions. That's why diplomats like Dutch design very much. So be aware of those questions. I mean, of course, you go to an embassy, it's, it can be a great, a great trip, but it's always the same superficial kind of way to use the idea of Dutchness. Yeah? yeah. Okay, I, well, I'll climb up to the highest ranks. So, there you are, go ahead. Hi, um, I'm not Dutch, and I'm not designer, so on paper, I'm the least uh, qualified to talk about <laughs> Dutch design, but, I feel like there is element of um, people who are within a culture won't really know about the culture unless they're exposed to another culture. So there's never really a culture without others around you. Yeah. I lived in Netherlands for two years, 12 years ago, moved to live a decade in UK, I'm back to Netherlands, completely different. Mm -hmm. um, if you ask me, I would say the Dutch design is about control over your environment. Yeah. So the, okay. the main thing that goes through all these examples that you mentioned is the fact that you are in control of everything, land, yeah. sea, yeah. my yeah. house, mine. So I feel like there are elements within a culture that you can trace, Yeah. but I it's agree. really hard to talk about yeah. typical, because when I was thinking while you were presenting also, would people in that era count that as typical Dutch, when designers thought that's yeah. a Dutch way of doing yeah. things. Well, I think what you say is uh, spot on. Well, to start Thanks. with, of course, you're completely uh, more than anyone else, of course, to allow to compare or to qualify Dutch design, because you can compare. I mean, this is what I did was very unacademic and unscience-like, un un because the moment you want to define something, you have to compare it. And I didn't do that, or, and, so, and you can to start with, and two, if I had, uh, well, even longer than now, I have, well, even a longer presentation. There was, a, I think, a great, uh, uh, well, you, you know it very well, a, 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 a building, a pavilion by uh, architectural office MVRDV made in Hanover uh, during an international exhibition. And it had stapled landscapes. It's a building with stapled artificial Dutch <laughs> landscapes, and it, and, and, and it explains or commu communicates your idea of that everything in the Netherlands is, well, under control or at least man-made. It's, it's artificial. I once had a presentation in, uh, in Siberia, <laughs> in, in Russia, and I tried to explain that in the Netherlands, even the romantic shores and the Veluwe uh, uh, are for a large part made by people. And they couldn't get it in their, in, in their heads because <laughs> Siberia is, is true nature, you could say. And we imitate nature, so even that is control. Hmm. So feel free to have the next lecture here and explain and, 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 and compare and explain because it's very spot on. Yeah, thank you for your intriguing comment, thanks. I'm descending and I think it's almost nine o'clock. Why so are all the people from abroad in the back and the Dutch people in front? Maybe you're right, we're <laughs> the a little bit too blunt they're and direct. <laughs> they're very <laughs> blunt. <laughs> Maybe you can ask this gentleman, you know the, the style house in Hengelo, where is it? In, in Hengelo is, uh, is in, in the road uh, from, 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 uh, from the Wijk uh, Grootdrine. You, you, you go along and, and you come uh, to the university yeah. There is a there is that house. And who, who built it? Uh, I don't know, but it's it's from the 30s that house, and and, and all and another is from 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 Lochem is also from before the Second World War. Yeah, there mm -hmm. are two anyway. You live there? Yes. Okay. You and live there. It, it's built by Van Lochem. Look, <laughs> who, who? Van Lochem was an architect, and he built it in 1934. And he was from the same school of Rietveld. Yeah. You know the reason I went to Siberia was because of the architecture of Van Lochem, yeah, who, was, also. who was a communist and who built in Russia with money of Lenin. But not successfully. Not very successful, <laughs> no. <laughs> no. And while I'm descending, um, Timo, I, uh, one thing in, intrigued me. You talked about um, one idea for the students to take to Indonesia and Australia is the idea that 
um, Dutch design is morally inspired, ethically yeah. driven. Um, but that holds also for the Bauhaus design, isn't it? Because of course. Yeah, they, yeah. they also want yeah, to make a better... Yeah, 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 yeah. For many design. So, Theo van Doesburg, you know, you, you could say the chairman of the style, did almost yeah. everything to, be, to become a professor uh, yes, yeah. at the Bauhaus, and he gave lectures in a hotel quite near uh, the Bauhaus. Yeah. People wanted to, ha or uh, students wanted to, him to become professor, mm -hmm. but uh, the director of the Bauhaus, Walter Gropius, completely disliked Theo van Doesburg as many people <laughs> and he didn't invite him anymore he did want, he, d he didn't want him at the school uh -huh. but there was a close connection especially around well 23 24 yes okay yeah. and, and to round off just to get a, uh, a clearer picture of this whole idea could you give an example of a famous design which isn't ethically driven which is just which a, is ethically driven. yeah just just a and not morally inspired just a well I, I have to say that that something if you're more ethically driven or morally driven you're not a better designer and not a better human being than if you're not mm -hmm. well mm -hmm. let, let's start no, by okay, saying yeah, that. that that's that's, that's and i think clear, well yeah. I, I can think of many italian designers who are not morally driven i know of the work of for instance uh, mario bellini uh, he has made a few fantastic tables mm -hmm. one, one of the most exciting tables is a complete marble table with five big marble feet yes okay well, don't mention the word sustainability. Don't mention the word, the word nature inclusive. This is only about aesthetics and okay. beauty. Uh -huh. And okay. I think it completely, or at least in the 70s, it was completely impossible that a Dutch designer would have made the table with five legs. Yes. Yeah. For yeah. marble. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, that's a very clear example. Um, we have to round off, unfortunately. Um, luckily, you will be here afterwards so if you have any more questions please come and talk to uh, to timo afterwards um, thank you very much it was really food for thought um, i hope the students got inspired i see them nodding on the first row and i think um, your your most important proposition um, that dutch design is morally or ethically inspired i think that's a very interesting takeaway home message to think about things which you encounter there's so many dutch designs but when i prepared this lecture i realized that everything around us is designed this this is designed the computer yeah. my watch uh, yeah. this building um, and it's very interesting to think about the ethics in it and to compare it with indonesian design i personally i don't have any image with indonesian design do you have i have the same cliches about indonesian design as many people have about dutch design yes yeah yeah, yeah. okay yeah. that's a good one yeah so i wish you very good luck during your trip uh, i think your eyes are opened uh, this evening by uh, timo de rijk and i want a very big hand for timo thank you so much <laughs>